All righty, I'm ready. All right, hello everyone and welcome to the San Anselmo Library's Virtual Art Talk Tuesday, California Pop Art. I'm Sariana, the Adult Services Librarian at the San Anselmo Public Library. And before we begin, I'd like to thank the Friends of the Library and the Library Parcel Tax for sponsoring this program and all the library programs. Everyone will remain muted throughout the presentation. If you have a question, please type it into the chat box or the Q&A box, and we will answer all questions at the end of the presentation. Technology can be very fickle, and I want to thank you all in advance for your patience and understanding during this program. We are recording the program today, and I'll try to send out the link to everyone later today or early tomorrow. Our speaker today is Avril Angevine. Avril is an arts lecturer with a particular interest in modern and contemporary art and California art. She has lectured on both topics at various locations in the Bay Area, including the OLLI programs at Cal State East Bay and Dominican College. Avril has an MA in Comparative Literature from UC Berkeley and teaches English and Humanities at local colleges. She is also a museum guide at SFMOMA and a docent at OMCA. Please join me in welcoming Avril Angeline to Virtual Art Talk Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sariana. Fun, fun to be back. Fun to be back um, with you in San Anselmo over here in Berkeley. It's been raining buckets. We're all waiting for that, but I know in San Anselmo that can be a problem sometimes. So I hope you're all dry and welcome. Thank you for coming today. Let me see if I can share my screen, bring the topic up here. Okay, it's slideshow. Yes, I know. Slideshow from the beginning. There we are, California pop. So let's, uh, okay, all right, good. So uh, welcome. I hope you'll find this uh, session fun. It was fun for me putting it together, not just pop art, but the peculiar kind of pop that comes from California. Uh, these are works, of course, done in the 60s and 70s a time of widespread social change. And looking back now, we might uh, be tempted to call a lot of it sort of goofiness, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, but I want you to know that the artists we're gonna look at today are consummate craftspersons. They're using the art skills developed over centuries to create a picture of their changing world. And uh, it's a lot of fun and what's not to like. Now, I often tell my students that you can define something as clearly by saying what it isn't as by saying what it is. So I'm gonna start by discussing what pop art isn't and it isn't abstract expressionism. So the soulful, serious art of the post-war years of the 1950s. The US of course came out of World War II uh, as a victor and the war years seem to have brought us closer intellectually anyway to our devastated allies in Western Europe. In France, uh, of course, existentialism was the order of the day. Uh, here's Jean-Paul Sartre, uh, one of the main proponents of existentialism, probably thinking about how to be a coherent subject in an incoherent world, something like that. Now, Americans perhaps are not quite as deep, Maybe, but the 50s are a time of soul searching, socially as well as personally, which we can see reflected in our cultural heroes, right? Like James Dean or Miles Davis. Uh, of course, we did have some fun in the 50s as uh, Audrey Hepburn does here in Funny Face and uh, you know Maynard G. Krebs and his bongos were always good for a laugh. But in the 50s, the New York School of Abstract Expressionism put the victorious US on the art map for the first time. Really, New York became the center of the art world. And their art reflected the serious concerns of the post Hiroshima world in works like this famous one, um, Green Silver by Jackson Pollock. Um, <laughs> I don't know why right here, hand is raised. Um, uh, Pollock explained what he was doing this way. He says, the modern painter cannot express this age, the airplane, the atom bomb, the radio, in the old forms of the Renaissance or of any other past culture. So instead of the old forms, perspective, modeling, narrative art, and so forth, uh, the other tools of the trade, he was going to do something new. So what else could we do? Well, he's still using paint 
and canvas. Canvas is on the floor. The paint's not applied usually with a brush, but kind of thrown. But as he says, the modern artist is working with space and time and expressing his feelings rather than illustrating. Okay, well, what about nature in New York school painting? Well, as I guess they would say, forget about it. According to Pollock, he said, I do not paint nature, I am nature. So these expressions of feeling by the abstract expressionists were juicy, color-filled adventures, and they were big, uh, as big as the nature they were not depicting. As Clifford Still said, it's intolerable to be stopped by the frame's edge. So he did 10 and 12 foot canvases as big as you can get. Now, in California, artists were painting expressionistically too and expressing their feelings. And San Francisco had a great deal of beatnik uh, credibility. After all, Jack Kerouac, Allen Ginsberg came out here. Ginsberg read Howell in 1956. April? Yes. I'm really sorry to interrupt, but okay. um, one person has said they can't see the artwork. Do you, is, I, so I want to see, um, can I get a show of hands of people who also cannot see the artwork? Can you use the raise hand icon or message in the chat? I see the artwork fine, so yeah, I'm- You do, okay. Yeah, I wondered what that was. Uh, I, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I don't seems, know either. It seems um, to be there for me, but I don't, uh, I don't know. I do not see the artwork. I, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing it, but I, nobody else is raising their hand. So I'm hoping that means, um, everyone else sees it so why don't you continue and i'll work with the, the attendee oh okay. okay um as you said at the beginning technology is fickle it's very fickle yeah we experience all kinds of uh traps and snares in doing these programs <laughs> okay. sorry karen i hope you get that sorted out uh anyway here we are Back in San Francisco, where um, Allen Ginsberg is reading Howell in 1956 at the Sixth Gallery. There's their poster there. You can see everybody who was there at the time. And this was an event attended by a whole roster of San Francisco painters. Um, many of them were, the big news in the 50s uh, was the Bay Area figurative movement, but there were lots of abstract painters going on too, like, uh, okay, so now I stopped, so I have to do it this way. Oh, there we go. Okay, like Bernice Bing, here's her lady and the roadmap. There's an exhibit of her work at the Asian Art Museum right now, if you're interested, she's really cool. So Bernice Bing or Frank Lobdell, these painters were doing the same sort of expressionistic, feeling full, giant, juicy works um, as they were in New York, really. And even for a brief period, actually, it was a summer school session at the San Francisco Art Institute. Mark Rothko was even a San Francisco painter. And he, of course, was so serious that he said his works expressed only the most important emotions, tragedy, ecstasy, doom, and so on. Okay. But the 60s dawned and there was something in the air, something different. So maybe it was because we now had, you know, TV dinners, Aquanet hairspray and rock and roll, but artists turned from their inmost feelings and began looking at the world again <clears throat> and at all the cool things we had in this world. And thus pop art was born. The most famous pop artist, of course, is Andy Warhol. And he broke it all open when he made a painting of his favorite lunch, tomato soup. And he sculpted, or we can say constructed, because these are made out of wood, a whole series of Brillo cartons. I'm sure that it was the name that attracted Andy to this. Um, so objects from contemporary life being treated as art subjects, completely bizarre. So Andy showed us people too, mainly people who we could say perhaps were commodities like Elvis or Marilyn Monroe. Now, Andy had a couple of predecessors in New York, for instance, Robert Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns uh, were using uh, either real objects uh, like the goat, that's a stuffed Angora goat, right? Uh, or images of familiar objects like the flag that Jasper Johns used flags, targets and things uh, in their works. Warhol's contemporaries like Roy Lichtenstein 
mind printed imagery uh, as familiar as the flag, advertisements and comic books uh, in their works. There we go. And Lichtenstein has some fun here with the, there he is, with the idea of an image duplicator. <laughs> Everybody was an image duplicator in that time and place. Even somebody like Yves Saint Laurent, you can see that he's duplicating a very, very famous image um, from Western art in uh, this dress collection. And then we have somebody like Marisol, a Venezuelan born Parisian who was beautiful and mysterious. She partied with Andy Warhol, uh, who used her in a couple of his films. And she created this kind of sophisticated folk art that again, duplicated the image of uh, her friend, Andy Warhol. Now, like abstract expressionism, pop art started out as a New York phenomenon, but Warhol's soup can series was actually first shown in Los Angeles at the Ferris Gallery on La Cienega Boulevard. Uh, all of the cans were for sale, the images were for sale for $100 each. And the first museum survey of American pop art was this one, new painting of common objects at the Pasadena Art Museum in 1962. Now we can see here from the poster that California was nicely represented by two of the artists who are on the program today, two of the best known contemporary California artists anyway, and that's Ed Ruscha and Wayne Thiebaud, who are there with Warhol, Lichtenstein, and Jim Dine in this exhibit. Okay. Ed Ruscha. Well, Ed Ruscha certainly has the cheekiness that we associate with pop art. An early commentator called him a cowboy Magritte gone Hollywood. And this expression actually captures many important things about him. Uh, he wasn't actually a cowboy, but he grew up in Oklahoma and he's often described as laconic and spare, and he's still handsome in his 80s. Uh, like René Magritte, although Ruscha denies the influence, uh, Ruscha also paints um, intriguing objects out of context to surprising effect, like this, one of my favorite works by him that's at uh, LACMA, <laughs> the LA County Museum. And like the many 20th century artists who come out of advertising, including Rene Magritte, including Andy Warhol, Roy Lichtenstein, and Wayne Thiebaud, like all of them, Ruscha is also fascinated by the process of turning an object into an image. And of course, he likes typography. So after driving to Los Angeles in 1956, on Route 66, of course, Ruscha began his career and has been investigating and excavating LA's particular culture ever since in painting, photography, drawing, film, printmaking, and publishing, just about anything you can do. Hollywood, uh, as you can see, looms large uh, in Ruscha's work. <laughs> it's another one, and yet another one, right? But Ruscha also celebrates the streets of Los Angeles and has done so in over a million images. Many of his images appear in his artist's books, such as 26 Gasoline Stations from 1963, a series of photographs taken while driving Route 66 that year. And as you can see in the image on the right, you can see somebody's thumb that the book is actually quite, quite small. So um, an art book made up of photos of gas stations, you couldn't be more pop art than that, right? And since then, Ruscha has made over a dozen artist books, including the 25 foot long accordion folded every building on the Sunset Strip of 1966. So how did he do this? He put a motorized camera on the back of a pickup truck and he photographed every image, every building on Sunset Boulevard, the Sunset Boulevard famous in story and song. Uh, he did it along a continuous two and a half mile stretch of the boulevard, which is actually 24 miles long in total. And this is an artwork that's determined by a system rather than by any kind of subjective decisions. And the system is you just photograph everything. Uh, so we see everything. We see the good, the bad, the ugly, and even the doghouse. There we go. And then he did it again at least a dozen times between 1966 and 2007. 
Now, besides being fascinating images in themselves, Ruscha's photos form an astonishing record of LA's built environment during a time of radical change. The Getty Museum uh, a couple of years ago launched uh, a prog program called 12 Sunsets, Exploring Ed Ruscha's Archive, which is an interactive database of 65,000 images online that lets you kind of ride along with the artist virtually. And like, who wouldn't want to do that? It would be fun. But this isn't the end of Ruscha's fascination with streets. For instance, he did a series of street pavements emblazoned with street names. So these are acrylic on linen, they're paintings, Boulevard and the famous Pico and Sepulveda. And he did a lovely parking lot series. He did 34 of them and they're in a book. He captured empty Los Angeles car parks from a helicopter uh, early one Sunday morning in 1967, turning them uh, into pure geometry, the city appearing silent and lifeless so we're focusing rather than on people on constructions of human ingenuity. This is wonderful. And this one, even more interesting, uh, Chavez Ravine, Dodger Stadium, it's fascinating from above. Uh, we can see his interest in architecture, geometry, and his training in graphic art in his paintings of LA buildings, such as this uh, famous and rather immortalized standard station, and also in Norms on Fire. He also did LACMA on Fire, and Norms is a diner down there. So he likes stuff like this. In the mid-60s, Ruscha focused on smaller objects, removing them from their normal sphere of influence, as Magritte described his own process, uh, in paintings like Actual Size, the spam can that I just showed you. And in these works, the idea of literal representation moves into the realm of the absurd in works like this one. Uh, many of them uh, involve fish, as in the Baltimore Oriole, securing a freshwater fish there. Um, a fish appears in nearly half of this series of paintings. And another frequent element is Ruscha's continuous depiction of a transformed pencil, the tool of the trade of an artist, uh, here turned into a bird. And also many of these works uh, like this one, give him anything and he'll sign it, have the kind of um, random titles that really don't explain the work particularly. This also is similar in Magritte, it does the same thing. Uh, and um, then there are his word paintings, which do the same thing to words that he's done to objects. He skews the meaning of each word through color, background, and font. And he, he particularly likes noise words like oof, which uh, kind of comes from the funny pages from Popeye punching somebody. This particular work is at uh, MoMA New York. So early works of his uh, featured one word like oof or like sin with olives. There, there's a couple of olives, um, which this one particularly makes the word physical in a weird way. So it's made out of paper that he's uh, depicting. Many of the words are seemingly in a liquid substance, like this one, Rancho. Uh, in this one, this is just how they look. This actually is an oil painting, but sometimes he actually used a non-art material for these works, like chocolate, like axle grease, like cherry pie filling, tobacco, or fruit flavored Metrical. Do you remember what Metrical was? A diet drink or something? Uh, and this one, uh, which is done in gunpowder, which is actually graphite, this is similar to what's in a pencil. It's quite extraordinary. And uh, FYI, Ruscha's only full installation was done for the Venice Biennale in 1970. It was a room lined with paper screen printed with chocolate paste. And yes, they did have a problem with ants. Now his later works move up to full sentences uh, in an all caps typeface of his own invention called Boy Scout Utility Modern. It's kind of um, a square font uh, with the corners lopped off. 
curved lead chrome does it have the corners locked off um, as in the Hollywood sign does the same thing. Now these phrases, most of which are kind of nonsensical, he says they're things he overheard in the city of Los Angeles. There used to be vacant lots. The other one, the music from the balconies nearby was overlaid by the noise of sporadic acts of violence. This one actually is a line from uh, J.G. Ballard's dystopian novel, High Rise. They, they were friends and he used this title in there. Um, Ballard's vision of a dark, futuristic urban environment kind of contrasts with the rural scene um, that's in the background of this painting. Maybe it's California or maybe it's the Oklahoma prairies of Ruscha's youth, don't know. Now, if you are in New York next year, uh, MoMA New York is going to have a retrospective of Ruscha's work, which will include a restaging of his chocolate room or you can wait and see this retrospective when it comes uh, later in the year to LACMA. Now, I know how much all us fans of California art love LA, so we're gonna stay there a little bit longer so I can introduce you to a favorite artist of mine who has disappeared from notice really, but when Life Magazine devoted a whole issue to California in 1962, with features on the mighty UC system, on the aerospace industry, and on Yosemite, it focused on five contemporary artists making the scene. It did not include Ed Ruscha, but it did include Roger Kuntz. There he is. This is my second uh, California pop artist. Now, Kuntz's eerie, humanless, and in fact, carless images like this one from the early 60s mine the then developing freeway system in a different way than Ruscha did. Uh, his works don't seem to have the irony and cheekiness of many pop images. I find them melancholy myself, actually. His paintings of overpasses, underpasses, and freeway signs and lane lines um, rendered in a reduced palette of black, white, gray and Caltrans green hover between abstraction and figuration and shift between these mutually exclusive artistic stances. Um, though carefully and accurately rendered, Kunz's images seem to suggest solitude and mystery in these monumental works of human engineering that now seem like a natural feature of the California environment, like Half Dome or like Methuselah the 5,000 year old bristlecone pine tree near Bishop that has its own visitor center. Kunz's close up and oddly cropped images contradict the monumentality of the freeway system that British architectural historian Rainer Banham so delighted in. And they recall for us the moments of heightened attention we experience on the freeway. Did I just miss my exit? Can I make that four lane change? Was that Larry David who just passed me? There he is with Jeff. Yes, it was Larry David. Now, Kuntz was born in 1926, and as a child, he moved from Texas to Hawaii to California, ending up with his family here at Loma Land, the famous theosophical community near San Diego. He studied art at Pomona College under Millard Sheets, LA's celebrated mid-century painter and muralist, Sheets is the man responsible for the fabulous mosaics on the home savings buildings. Um, if you grew up in LA as I did, then you remember those, they were all over the place. Pence so began teaching at Scripps College after service in the Army Air Corps and a study trip to Europe, and he eventually moved to Laguna Beach, became a beach guy. He was a widely exhibited landscape painter in the 50s, uninterested in the abstraction that dominated American art in the post-war years. He felt that a return to structure and figuration was on the horizon. And in fact, it was. It was called pop art. Kunz's stark, reductive freeway scenes were clearly understood as pop expressions. After all, freeway signs like Campbell soup cans and like comic books and so forth are anti-art subjects. He was included in an early national exhibit of pop art held at the Oakland Museum in 1963. But how ironic that the work of a California painter might be too meditative, too thoughtful to really be pop. Melancholy in the land of Disney and the Beach Boys seems odd. 
Um, here's another one. They're so interesting. And here's some of his signs that he does. Very close up one. <laughs> does tell us something. In the last decade of his life, Kunz painted a series of brooding images of figures in and around bathtubs, uh, on beaches, and on tennis courts, which prompted some critics to compare him to the artists of the Bay Area figurative movement, like Richard Diebenkorn. You can kind of see that here, although I like that the image on the right has the target on it. And, and on the left, out the window, we have the same kind of geometric structures that he's so interested in. Here's another of his bathtub paintings, very much like uh, Diebenkorn, we could say. Um, but his fanciful images of the Goodyear blimp in a variety of situations, um, these are the works of an artist interested in the absurdity, I think, of contemporary life. Now, Kunz died in 1975 when he was only 49 years old. And if you are interested in him, there's a gallery specializing in his works on Santa Monica Boulevard in Los Angeles. And they're in many museums in LA, not so much up here, none that I know of. So now, in any case, we're ready to take the 10 to the 405 to the 5 and make that long drive up to the Bay Area where we'll meet one of our state's premier pop artists a man who, like uh, Roger Kunz, lacks the snarkiness of Warhol and the New York crowd and has a juicy, tactile style of painting that's as far from Warhol's flat silkscreen as can be. And you know, of course, I'm talking about Wayne Thiebaud. Thiebaud's work always depended on the basically traditional disciplines of drawing and painting and a love of realism. Uh, essential skills for the graphic or advertising artist, which he originally was. Thibault was born in Mesa, Arizona, but his family moved to Long Beach when he was still a baby. One summer during high school, uh, he apprenticed at the Disney Studios, uh, drawing in-betweens of Goofy, Pinocchio, Jiminy Cricket, and this guy at a rate of $14 a week. He later worked as a cartoonist and an advertising designer in California and in New York, including serving in the first motion picture unit of the army from 1942 to 45. But in New York City in the late 50s, Thibault became friends with a number of artists with Elaine and Willem de Kooning and with the early pop artists we looked at before, Robert Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns. And he began a series of very small paintings based on the way food is displayed in American diners. So his food work um, focuses on repetition of basic shapes, triangles, circles, uh, squares, and so forth, and the application of a thick impasto paint, often with a knife, just like the way you would actually ice a cake. The brightly colored objects are near life size and they are, appear in a shallow field and almost always include the heavy shadows that are characteristic of advertising. Now, his early food works here slightly predate the interest in mass consumption objects that characterizes the pop art of the early 60s, and, but they led to Thibault's inclusion with Ruche in new painting of common objects at the Pasadena Art Museum. But Thibault dislikes Andy Warhol's flat and mechanical, as he calls them, paintings, and does not count himself really as a pop artist. For he claims that his interest in diner food is nostalgic, not ironic. That these images remind him of the America of his youth, and that even when he was a kid working in restaurants, he saw poetry in them. So sliced circle. Okay, so here on the left is a Thibaut and there some snarky, ironic, kind of slightly nasty bananas by Andy Warhol, of course, it's a difference. Now, when Thibaut paints an object or a form, he famously surrounds it with multiple colors, often in stripes or lines of equal intensity to create a kind of halo effect. And you have to look closely to see this, this is an enlarged image here the blue and red together, complementary colors that pop off. And as he says, the colors are fighting for position. That's what makes them vibrate when you put them next to each other. 
Thibault also um, did look at the landscape. He did a number of landscapes, streetscapes, and mountainscapes in which we can see his combination of realism and illusionism in works that are um, inspired by memory and completed in the studio. So here's one I like this early orange groves of 1966. Now you can see in this work a similarity to the way he does his cakes and uh, desserts that we just looked at. Objects in a row, strongly lit to produce these bluey shadows in a clear defined horizon line, which is um, a landscape's key stabilizing device. But these trees don't recede uh, properly um, in a correct perspective. In case you didn't notice that, this is what an orchard actually looks like from the highway. Let's look back at this picture. Also, this is more subtle. The trees are lit by a low sun from the left so that the shadows are on the right side of the trees, while the hills behind them are lit from the right so that the shadows are on the left. So clearly this is a total fabrication, dramatic and unsettling, perhaps in a way that the cakes and pies aren't. Oh, rid of that. A work like this one, this is Flatland River from, River from 1995, uses a similar mixture of competing perspectives, changes in scale, and unnatural and heightened color to create its effect. Um, and right in the front there, you can notice the plowed field, uh, paints applied with a knife, as I said, just like on his cakes. Cityscapes like this one share verticality, gridded structures, and aerial-like vantage points, and a visible delight in handling paint with the wonderful landscapes of Thibaut's great friend, Richard Diebenkorn. But underneath it all, Diebenkorn really is an abstract painter. Um, his works suggest landscape and feel like landscape, but Thibaut goes beyond this, bending nature to his conception of painterly order and illusion. And you can see another one, yeah, where the streets are so ridiculously perpendicular, the scale is off, really interesting things going on. Now, a work like this one, like Heart Ridge, one of his mountainscapes, might strike us and probably should strike us as uncomfortable because he's making evident something that nobody can see, and that's the force of gravity. We as viewers have no place to stand in this work. There's no far vista to relieve the tension. There are at least some little shrubberies and trees up at the top to indicate the massive scale here. Otherwise, it would be hard to read. Thibault has said that these images uh, that he does come from memories of living in southern Utah on a ranch overshadowed by a big mountain, a monolith with stuff on top. And that's exactly what we see. And best of all of these that he does, to my mind, is uh, Canyon Mountain at SF MoMA. It's huge. I don't know, it's about seven or eight feet tall. Uh, the most dizzying of all with its combination of superb, carefully planned analogous colors and the shocking verticality. Uh, it's a wonderful work. This one, possibly his last work, one of many, many New Yorker covers uh, Thibaut did over the years. And he died uh, just last year in 2021 at age 101. So he was still the Canyon Mountain, this huge thing was painted when he was close to 100 years old. Next, we're going to move to the work of another NorCal artist, a native San Franciscan who went to the Art Institute on a whim after having applied with a portfolio of sketches of movie stars copied from fan magazines. So that's Joan Brown. She actually bridges two traditions, the powerful Bay Area figurative movement that developed at the Art Institute when she was there and prior to that, and the slick, sassy style that we associate with pop art, which we can see in her work uh, in the 70s as be and beyond, and which we can also see in the work of the UC Davis artists of the era, like Robert Arneson, William T. Wiley, Roy DeForest, all of whom were colleagues of Wayne Thiebaud at UC Davis. 
Now, when Joan Brown first saw Diebenkorn's work at the Art Institute, she thought it was pointless. But artistic influence can be strong, especially among art students. And so by a year later, she is uh, embracing this figurative style. The figures are here, but reduced to the barest information. She's using this sludgy, heavy impasto that's characteristic of San Francisco painting of this period. Uh, bright colors combined with very dark colors. Here's a work of hers where it shows her interest in the deep, dark, penetrating works of the masters of Rembrandt, Goya, and Velazquez. And we can see her working with these influences in this flora of 1961 that's at the Crocker Museum. Now, Brown got a lot of attention early on as a woman in what was still considered a man's world. In 1960, when she was 22, she had her first show in New York and was the youngest person ever represented in what has become the Whitney Biennale. She was featured in Mademoiselle magazine. In 1962, her son Noel was born and under guidance from her main mentor, the painter Elmer Bischoff, Brown focuses on the world around her. So Lupe here is her mother-in-law. And here's a wonderful, huge work at SF MoMA called Noel in the Kitchen. That's her little boy with a droopy diaper there and a couple of dogs, Bob the dog. At this point, Joan was married to sculptor Manuel Neri, and she often modeled for him and occasionally painted uh, his plaster figures. He was known for figures made of plastic, plaster that often had paint um, uh, spread on them or displayed on them. She often did that. So this is uh, called Ma Model with Manuel Sculptures from 1961. And note Bob the dog down there in the right corner. But times were changing. Brown uh, became dissatisfied with her thick, dark works. So she actually gave up a New York gallery contract and devoted a year or so to studying, refining her technique, looking at things differently. And when she began to exhibit again, her style is radically different. And we do feel that we're entering another time, another place, another mood, and it's very, very pop. So we have something like this, the bride, the woman wearing mask and the bride, I'll show you in a second. Uh, she moves from painting in oil on canvas to painting with enamel on masonite, making the images flatter and more brittle. She's using skilled drafting rather than just color application. Uh, this became important to her. And she's creating representational images, um, not just from her own life, she continues to do that, but from dreams and from her own interests in life, like swimming to Alcatraz, which she did, uh, and dancing, she loved to dance, and by her study of mythology. The humans and the animals uh, in her works are now in more two-dimensional recognizable space. And we have lighter colors. Here's the bride, but they're <laughs> pretty unusual. And here's one called Wolf uh, in the studio. Let's see some more of her later works. Uh, this one. Gordon, Joan, and Rufus in front of the San Francisco Opera House from 69. So again, as I say, she's using images from her own life. This is her third husband, the artist Gordon Cook. And here's, I put this up here. This is a wonderful painting. I wonder if you recognize at all what she's looking at. So she, like everybody else in the pop era, is an image duplicator. So <laughs> she's thinking about the Grand Odalisque of Angre here. What do we have? And some of her wonderful self portraits with fish and cat, or this one after the Alcatraz swim. As I said, she was one of a group of people who swim in San Francisco Bay, which is very cold, out to Alcatraz. And the painting in the painting represents a moment when she and the other people she was swimming with, uh, I think a boat, a large ship came too near to them and they got disoriented and it was almost ended in disaster. And that's what's being represented there. But there she is uh, in this strange room, bizarre pop colors, um, as in Tebow, uh, the perspective is off the floor, looks like it's tipped directly up. It's a very interesting combination, uh, very wonderful images. 
And here's a, <laughs> a last image I really like of hers. This is at the De Rosa uh, Preserve in Napa. Um, it's interesting, there's a contrast going on in here. She's looking directly at us, but we have this crazy fur hat, the wildness of the fur hat balanced against the regularity of the checkerboard behind her. And even her shirt has this white piping and nice lines on it going all the way back. So uh, Joan Brown died in 1990. Uh, she was in India helping to erect a temple there when it collapsed and uh, she died rather young. Now, our last California pop artist may seem a slightly unusual choice. He's not usually mentioned in this connection, though he certainly peppers his wildly inventive works with consumer goods. Let me bring him up here. We're talking about Robert Colescott. Wikipedia describes him as a neo-expressionist, but I think of him as pop and is really part of the pop tradition in California. His works are brash and bright and have a lot in common with the UC Davis uh, funk art crowd, who, as I said, could themselves very easily be considered pop artists uh, in the California style. Um, this last pop artist here, Cole Scott, um, is not even usually mentioned as a typical California artist, though he was born in Oakland. He graduated from UC Berkeley. He watched Diego Rivera paint Pan American Unity on Treasure Island in 1940. And he was influenced by the Bay Area figurative artists, especially by Joan Brown. But I think you'll see that he qualifies both as a California artist and as a pop artist. He's pop in style, but in a way brand new in subject because his works are among the first to recast classic works of art um, with African-American characters. So as I said, he was born in Oakland in 1925 and was exposed to art at a young age. His parents were both musicians uh, and they had moved to Oakland from New Orleans in 1919 and were friends with local sculptor, Sergeant Johnson. After he graduated from Berkeley, Colescott studied in Paris with Fernand Leger. And he was light skinned enough to pass as white as a young man, but he experienced a racial awakening uh, with two uh, stints he did in Cairo, Egypt, a residency in 1964 and a teaching job uh, from 66 to 67. So at this point, he combines um, knowledge of the Western art tradition with interest in African, Egyptian, and Pacific Islands art. This is an early work from that period, We Await Thee, in which female nudes appear to be emerging from kind of a bank of stone. So they're varying skin tones as well as bodies and faces that are literally split, so half black, half white, become uh, kind of frequent in Colescott's work, perhaps reflecting tensions around his own racial identity as well as the nation's as a whole. So by 1968, though, important year for everyone, uh, he starts to use a cartoonish kind of a funk style, not really unlike Roy DeForest, but he uses it uh, to approach serious topics, race and the experience of being black in America, and he does it in his own way. So this work of 1990 called 1919, this, as I said, the year his parents um, moved to Oakland, uh, we could say this celebrates the pioneering spirit of his parents who moved west in 1919. Um, it's kind of like a 19th century silhouette tradition. We see the parents on left and right there um, in front of this uh, typical map of the United States with various elements on it that could be seen on a journey west. Um, you know, a moose, a house, a spotted mustang, you know, a cowboy, a, goat, an oil well gusher there in Texas. And in the center, uh, this image of the nest, his parents with the two birds, his brother and himself, um, and his older brother. Um, and yet in the pink clouds at the bottom, there's all kinds of detritus and junk flowing around in there. And this represents what Cole Scott described as the used underwear, popular trash, studio sweepings that didn't pass art history. So he, this is the style he adopts and he becomes uh, well known as a kind of image duplicator, if you like, 
in a work like this one, which is George Washington Carver crossing the Delaware. Uh, he's not copying comics or advertising art, but aiming at right at the heart of uh, the Western art tradition, the famous image of George Washington <laughs> crossing the Delaware. Um, he's reinterpreting masterpieces of Western art with his own African-American characters. Uh, this work was recently bought by George Lucas for over $15 million for his uh, Museum of Narrative Art that's going to open sometime uh, in Los Angeles, probably a couple of years. Let's look at another couple of his works. Oh, okay, Eat Dem Taters. Here he's working with a very famous image of Van Gogh, just populated with his own characters. In 1990, he wrote of making big, sensuous paintings. It's the first impact that people get, right? They're big and bright. They walk in and say, oh, wow. And then, oh, expletive, when they see what they have to deal with in subject matter. And he says, it's an integrated one-two punch. It gets them every time. So here we have, again, <laughs> the wreck wreckage of the Medusa. Um, something I gets a thrill too when I see Deku, um, kind of a mocking uh, example of one of de Kooning's uh, women paintings of the 50s, one of the few abstract artists to include anything kind of figurative at all in his works, but we have this kind of Aunt Jemima head at the top of it here. Um, or Bye Bye Miss American Pie. So he's definitely in the pop idiom, mining pop culture in works that have a, a sharp a kind of edge to them. And he uses stereotypes, black stereotypes, white stereotypes. Everybody comes in for it here. A little more. These are two works that are at SF MoMA that are, uh, I think, really interesting. So particularly uh, colored TV there on the right, uh, so many things going on. Don't know why the boot is on the ground there in the center of the painting. Perhaps this figure often wears boots and has dressed up to watch TV, watching um, a model, what you want to be on television, color TV. And you can see the background, the room, even the fireplace in the back, it looks very much like something Joan Brown might have done. I'll share that in common. So he combines a typically Northern California thick, luscious painting hand with the satirical wit of the funk artists. Here's, um, <laughs> he's reversed. We have Shirley Temple Black, who's now Black, and Bill Robinson, who's white. Um, in the scene from, I guess this is from the film Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm. Everybody's equal here. Um, so he combines, as I said, the, the, the painting style, typical of Northern California, the wit of the Funksters, the politics of the beatnik era, with a focus on the Black experience that's pretty much new um, in California art and American art. Um, he is, in fact, a direct ancestor of artists like Kehinda Wiley and others who have made their mark exactly by doing the same thing, by writing Black uh, characters, black figures into Western art. In uh, 1997, Cole Scott was the first black artist to represent the US at the Venice uh, Biennale, and he died in 2009. Um, at the moment, the very moment it's about to end, there's currently an exhibit of his work in New York. It's the first uh, really since 1989 at the, at the new museum. It was at Portland and Chicago prior to that. Do I have one more image here? Yeah, there we go. It's an interesting work, school days. Okay, so we see a figure in the front pointing a gun right at us, right in the center, a figure that's black on the top, the body turns to white, the kinds of things that I like, uh, particularly as football in the background. I like um, the figure of blind justice in the center there, a skeleton actually weighing a young man, black man, and some money on the two scales there. Very interesting, challenging work by Robert Colescott. So here we are, my five uh, California pop artists. There are, there are many others, but I think they represent a good slice of what was going on in this area. 
um, in the 60s and 70s when pop art was dominant in New York, California always has interesting things going on, I think. <laughs> so there we are. So, um, oh, a little early. Uh, there's a couple of things in the chat. I, let me see if there are questions. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Oh, Karen, okay, restart your Zoom. That's probably that. Any other question? Hi, thank you so ended much. October for the... 9th. Yeah, yeah, it just yeah, ended, the, yeah. yeah, the uh, so far in the Q and A's, uh, we have someone mentioning that the Cold uh, Scott yeah. retrospective at the new new museum ended yeah, October just, 9th. It just ended, yeah. Yeah, or October 9th. I can talk. I know what I'm saying. Okay. All right. Let me end the recording.